Zabrał ten kurtkę. Okej, okay, welcome back. And uh, let's start the discussion. And I will pass the mic to Monika, who is the host of the discussion. I would like to briefly introduce the participants. Uh, Professor Robert McCoy, you already know, so I will just remind you that uh, he's a professor of disability studies from uh, George Washington University, and um, he's focused on uh, creep theory in his investigation. Uh, we also have with us uh, Katarzyna Ojrzyńska, who is a uh, Associated professor, yes, yes. Uh, uh, at the University of Łódź, and her scientific interests include um, disability studies, disability history, disability representation, and uh, echo of creep theory. We also have uh, Filip Pavla with us, who is an art producer, a performer, activist, and disabled queer person, as he describes himself. Uh, he used to work in several cultural institutions in Poland, like that Nowy Warsaw, uh, but now he lives in Berlin, uh, where he collaborates with British Council and some other cultural institutions there. Uh, I will briefly introduce myself also. My name is Monika Bubiel. I am a PhD candidate at the um, Faculty of Artes Liberales University of Warsaw. Uh, I'm already finishing uh, my PhD thesis about um, artists with visual impairment in Mexico. Um, besides this, I also am um, strongly interested in uh, accessibility, especially accessibility of culture uh, for people with disabilities in Poland. Uh, before start, I would just to tell you that I have my mobile phone here, uh, at here, just for checking the time, okay? So whenever you see me that I'm checking something on my smartphone, it's not that I'm answering messages, it's just my watch. Um, okay, um, we will talk today about the situation of artists with disabilities in Poland during uh, the lockdown. So before we start, I would like to uh, quickly introduce the context uh, of this situation, we have to we have to mention several um, crucial facts uh, related to artists and to persons with disability in Poland at that time. So, uh, first of all, I would like to mention uh, the fact that had took place just before the pandemic, which was the implementation of the Accessibility Act in 2019. Uh, that was a huge step toward accessibility in Poland. Uh, but, honestly speaking, still is not fully implemented. Uh, but at least we have some uh, legal regulations. During the pandemic, we also had uh, we experienced also very strong social protests, street protests, uh, in 2020 and 2021, um, related to um, abortion ban in Poland, uh, the, the new anti-abortion law, and there was a huge feminist uh, protest in the streets uh, where persons with disabilities, actually women with disabilities, took part very actively. And another thing which is related uh, particularly with artists is, artists is that so far we didn't have a proper legislation uh, regulating um, the profession, artist profession, and now, as far as I know, uh, our um, government, our parliament is working on uh, a particular act dedicated to this question, but still we don't have any regulation, so artists have no, uh, actually the, the profession of artists doesn't have any concrete uh, legal frames still in Warsaw, so in Poland, sorry. Uh, I hope that they are uh, ready in Warsaw. <laughs> okay. Um, 
to, I would like to, to, to begin with uh, some, um, let's say, positive thinking part. This, this first part of our discussion, I would like to focus on some advantages, maybe, of, of the lockdown, of the pandemics. Uh, what did we gain or what we could gain uh, from the lockdown? Some potential that it brought to us. So, um, first of all, I would like to focus on the um, potential of reflection. Um, because, you know, during the pandemics, everything stopped. Uh, we had to stop what we were doing and suddenly we got a lot of free time to start thinking what actually we were doing and how we were doing those things. Um, so a lot of time for, for reflection on the one hand and on the other hand uh, everything what we were doing took much more time than before. For example, a uh, simple thing as shopping, I, I, I suppose that you still all remember that uh, it took ages. If you wanted to go to shop, you had to wait because of the limitations of the number of people inside and so on. So it could be said, it, we, we can say maybe that we all function according to a creep time because, you know, it, every, everything took much more time and we uh, sometimes couldn't do some, some stuff in the time that we were used to it. So, um, because we can say somehow, maybe, that um, lockdown uh, is a situation like disabling for the whole society. Um, and th this, this is what I would like um, to discuss now with you. Can we think about this time of pandemics as a, as a creep time and uh, in uh, close relation to what uh, has been said here during the lecture, uh, as you know, in terms of artistic work, uh, what Robert mentioned uh, about these modalities. For example, can, can we relate somehow this uh, creep time and pandemic time to this modality of um, process of a product? We will focus on doing than on, on the effect. Um, so yes, that, that's more or less uh, what I would like to, to ask you, how do you think this um, you know, change of, of uh, experience, experience of time impact uh, functioning of people with disabilities and, and maybe a general perception of disability? And I would like to start from Robert. Um, I think everything that you just said is true. There is a way in which the pandemic shifted everyone onto an experience of time very like what many disabled people already knew. I am, so you identify that as an optimistic place, place to begin. I also am pessimistic as well. <laughs> I, one of the theories that I write about in Crip Theory is a theory of compulsory able-bodiedness, the ways in which we inhabit a system that is basically demanding that we all have able bodies and able minds and that we're constantly um, pushing to achieve this impossible ideal. Um, and I think compulsory able-bodiedness is very resilient. <laughs> and so my pessimistic side would suggest that some negative things have happened over the course of the past few years as well um, with an expectation that we more flexibly, but work all the time from home and on Zoom and be available around the clock. And um, so I think we did learn a lot of disability lessons, uh, whether we are disabled or not, um, but that those are lessons that are hard to keep and we have to I think, continue learning them in the face of an ongoing demand that we produce more and spend more time and constantly be available. So those lessons are sort of on um, the lines. Okay. okay, so perhaps if I could add a bit to this idea of process over the product, I, I think that it's not only visible in, in arts, in artistic industry, it's basically everywhere in uh, our neoliberal capitalist system, also in the academia, where we, well, when we apply for grants, then we need to actually 
produce a specific number of uh, articles, monographs that will be uh, well published in specific publishers' houses and uh, well um, that can be somehow evaluated to measure and so on and so forth. And uh, that's why I think it is uh, important here to mention that uh, our meeting today is taking place as part of this research platform, which is very unique because uh, my colleagues got a grant from the Jagiellonian University for a project, two-year long project, which doesn't aim to produce a monograph or a series of articles, but its major aim is to facilitate networking. And I think it is not uh, accidental that actually this initiative um, well, has its roots in disability studies. Uh, and um, I was also thinking about um, the thing that you said, Mo Monica, about um, yeah, uh, the pandemic being a kind of a disabling to um, everyone and also to all artists and in particular artists with disability and I think that this actually greatly contributed to um, uh, the idea of designing this new law that is supposed to give some legal status to uh, uh, professional artists um, which will facilitate uh, them um, uh, well uh, which will give them a, a possibility to, to get some um, uh, social benefits and it also um, hopefully will open certain opportunity for um, artists with disabilities, especially for those who do not have uh, access to um, um, artistic education and this particularly concerns I think actors um, who have very, very limited access to um, an actor training uh, in Poland because, um, well, um, well, the law is not ready yet, but you may get the this, this status of a professional um, um, artist based on your, um, um, uh, on your work, right, if you've done so far, and based on the overall, right, so I think that's quite important, yep. Um, <laughs> I will try so many uh, topics. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for the question, Monica. Um, what um, Pandemia gave us in terms of accessibility? Can I just reframe it in that way? Um, I think. Reflect, I think, yeah, this, uh, I was working full time as a producer in that theatre and also linking to what you said, Robert, about the uh, time, uh, quick time. Uh, last, uh, uh, like half year ago, we did a conference in Europe, in London, uh, with artists with disabilities from all over the world. And this, uh, like 20 uh, artists uh, in the project European Access, uh, and everybody was speaking about the time, that we need more time. That was really common. Like, uh, we didn't use like this whole theory thing, which is like incredible that is existing as a moment. It's not my work, I'm much more practitioner. Um, but, uh, now I'm thinking and just remembering this moment when everybody was speaking, okay, so what is the difference, how we are working and how are the normal workers in the culture, or actors, choreographers, and uh, mainstream in, uh, in the European artistic institutions. And the pressure of time, this capitalist uh, vision of like being proactive, being efficient, being hyperproductive, like achieved the ideal body uh, was really it's a big pressure for all the artists. And I think uh, what Pandemia gave us was like a common reflection in the mainstream and in our group that we know something that is maybe not common in their world of uh, mainstream. Uh, I don't like to just separate these two words between we and them, but let's like. I will just uh, uh, simplify it right now and use it. Uh, but we discovered that we have a lot of knowledge that we can share right now. And 
it's really avant-garde and it's uh, great and people are really interested in listening to us when we start when we start speaking about it. we need more space like the ways how institutions are working are just not human at all are just uh, really terrible uh, all the Me Too movement, all the feminism topics. Like, it is in the last four years, I'm thinking we changed so. Like, it's groundbreaking uh, for me as an artist and producer that I'm starting to recognize my um, experience as something important and equal. Um, equal as a normal uh, or as a level that I was always excluded from. So for me, this is like a big moment of the networking between the, uh, for this time, really separated worlds, art worlds, and uh, also big network of Euro artists. And I will add one more thing, that because like everything, uh, um, went to the uh, internet that gave us a lot of opportunities to uh, show our work, but uh, like to be a more pessimistic maybe. Uh, I think the big energy and the big, um, like we get a lot of power with this, uh, we are excluded again, uh, that in many countries, like people with disabilities were not rescued and they were last to take to the hospital uh, to get a uh, health care during the pandemic and I think it brings the really terrible reflection of T4 action and uh, organics and right now we have internet and we started to screaming about it like oh god we are excluded again we will die like please you can do it you are a European Union you are fighting with the bad things like I think it brings a lot of uh, Power to our communities, our disabled, queer, queer communities. It's a lot of topics, so sorry. Thank you so much. Uh, when you said that, oh, you are European Union, you are fighting with bad things, it reminded me when I was in Mexico and I talked to find actors there and I said that, you know, in Poland you cannot get. Um, formal uh, edu actual education when you are disabled because you are not just you are not accepted in the school and they were shocked they were like but aren't you part of European Union how is it possible <laughs> so um, you know <laughs> sometimes it's just an illusion but they fight with bad things but okay um, I would like to follow up some topics that you mentioned because they they, they seem very interesting. And continuing a little bit this, um, you know, thinking about a lockdown as a maybe potential, uh, I would like to now focus on more, on more an artistic dimension about, and I would like to talk about um, creative potential of lockdown. Because it's obvious that um, when artists, uh, artists are like, locked down in their houses, they don't have access to stage, to the cultural institution where they used to work, and they have to look for some new ways of expression, new uh, forms of artistic expression. So it uh, requires some kind of creativity. Um, and what what uh, Philip mentioned a little bit is that I think uh, pandemics contributed uh, to some extent, of course, not always, not everywhere, but to let's say, um, um, to, to the fact that art became more democratic, I mean, more accessible, more accessible both for the artists and for the, uh, for the viewers. Because, uh, for example, uh, those artists that Kasia mentioned, who don't have um, formal education and they cannot enter like official theatres, they uh, gained this uh, internet platform where they, where they can uh, show their works. And also, a um, lot of viewers, and especially people with disability, uh, got the uh, 
possibility to you know to, to watch uh, films or spectacles, but uh, usually if I don't have possibility to see because uh, of geographic barriers, for example. Um, so on the one hand, I think um, we can say that lockdown uh, increased accessibility of art for, for, for the artists and for the viewers, but uh, for sure it, it might some um, obstacles also. Um, but I, I would like to focus again maybe and look for uh, some positive sides. So uh, how do you think it um, contributed to creativity? So how uh, artists, especially artists with disabilities, uh, made use, creative use, of the situation of lockdown, of isolation. Um, and I would like uh, Philip and Kasia to, to refer to some examples from Poland and, and Robert, maybe to uh, give us some more examples, because you already mentioned, for example, uh, this uh, work of Tatra Siego, uh, but maybe some, something more uh, you can share with us. Um, so maybe I will start again with Robert, and then we will pass to Silver Pesha. Um, I think a, a good example that has perhaps started shifting back is the way in which many film festivals went on. Uh, so I, I'm most familiar with the Messi Patrick Beer Film Festival that happens every year in Prague. Um, and the pandemic did force our creative way of retaining an audience by basically going um, entirely online for, I think, two years and then ending up being in some sort of hybrid fashion. That may be changing now that film festivals can happen again in person, but I think um, that was one adaptation that was quickly evident. I um, you know of a couple others. Midlands for Film Festival that I participated in in the UK. Um, there are there are others that went online to try to make sure that they lost did not lose their audience. I think there can be a challenge in terms of money. Um, so for I don't have these figures right at the tip of my fingers, but um, in another version of what I presented today, I look at how by the end of 2020, um, the unemployment figures in the U.S. Uh, for artists were basically double of almost every other profession. So, um, you know, servers may have gone back to working in restaurants or whatever, but that didn't mean that actors were uh, back in the theater or that other artists were able to uh, regain the work that they lost over the course of 2020. So, I think there have been these wonderful hybrid things that have happened online, film festivals being the example that I just talked about, but I, I think there are a lot of artists that, that also cautioned, okay, just because we're at home and able to see you on Zoom doesn't mean we still don't need to get paid. Um, and it's great that we can do all this artistic stuff that crosses borders, uh, and so it brings together people from a range of different countries, and they're all right there on Zoom. Um, but for artists, uh, I think during the pandemic, that came with the challenge of still needing to feed themselves, and people assuming off of Zoom that it's like, well, it's going to be much more affordable for us to do this on Zoom. Uh, and um, so artists, I think, have been at the forefront of thinking about how art involves labor as well, and labor in the the scroll that we live in needs to be compensated somehow. Uh, so um, now I would like to ask Kasia and Philip, especially if you can, um, for example, uh, tell something about this um, performance uh, Beyond the Quarantine. I think it will be in English like this. Uh, it, it, it's um, done by artists with disabilities during the lockdown and you know they, they were saying something like what do you know about, about isolation because you know we are isolated all our lives so we will teach you how to live in isolation so can we say that it's kind of like creeping the pandemics creeping the lockdown how do you think oh and maybe you can mention some more examples mm, i will start this time and only add that yeah, culture started to be more accessible for those who stayed alive. Uh, because for 
for my last uh, lot of talks in the last half a year with uh, plenty of artists and disabilities around the Europe. Uh, that we are, I think, still not enough conscious how much people with disabilities died and passed away because of uh, governments and because of the biopolitics of uh, uh, governments and who was first to be saved. Uh, I mean, right now it's maybe thinking too much about it. But I'm coming back to positive uh, things. Uh, with uh, my friends from Poland, we did a performance, like a video performance, uh, beyond the quarantine. And it was because of, um, as you mentioned, Robert, uh, like artists had to do something. And uh, in the uh, Polish uh, theatre sector, we have like really, I think, uh, this is my opinion, but we have a really good position in Europe. We have. Uh, uh, public funding and uh, like a lot of actors are on the, like permanent contracts. Uh, so they were just you know sitting in home and bored, and uh, they had to do something because like the city council or the administration uh, organizers of theaters like required to do something because they get money and they cannot play because it's an isolation. So let's let let's let's do everything in the uh, internet. And they started to like posting in 2020, 2021, uh, a lot of videos about the reflection of being isolated. And that was really basic things. And I was just, really? Really? You, like, start, you will teach me how to be isolated? Like, you hypermobile people who are just working in a lot of countries, like, without any orders in a lot of times, obviously, like, there's. Uh, I'm generalizing, but uh, it's, you know what I'm speaking about. And we just get mad about it with uh, artists. Uh, that it was the group of artists with disabilities that we uh, had in the uh, Theatre Institute in Warsaw and France. And I was just, okay, so let's do our version. Okay, I, uh, so that was like a series of uh, videos hosted by the Studio Theatre, uh, Warsaw Studio Theatre. Uh, with uh, like short artworks by the non-disabled artists uh, from the ensembles and another like re uh, really um, known artists from the, from the Polish actors or the directors and they were just you know having this reflection that I'm sitting too home, I'm bored, what to do and this is God, it's really good, it's, it's um, like we want to speak also about it. And we did uh, the video performance, we, we recorded ourselves with some uh, sarcastic text and uh, voiceover uh, where we are speaking that, you know, you want to, like, we will teach you how to sit. We are experts in sitting in a hall, in uh, being excluded from the social life. We can teach you how to spend one year in a hall because uh, you are afraid of going out because also you are old woman uh, who don't have elevator in your ten um, floors building and you cannot go outside without help and it's a lot of groups that are excluded from the social life and for us that was really nice because it was um, recognized by the people around um, we got uh, Comments from the internet and in the magazines, and people were just okay. Maybe it's in, maybe it's interesting topic to just uh, have a more reflection about it. And after it was a lot of other artistic activities, but for now I don't need to stop here. But for us, it was really nice to just get back the, our space to to fight for our voice to just uh, be more visible. Uh, I think it was one of the few uh, performances that brings us back to the public sphere in the last few years. So uh, that's for me, that was a personal reason, uh, a really important experience. Perhaps I could add two more um, uh, examples. Um, um, and it's um, two performances by um, actress from Theatre 21, and I'm a great fan of uh, Theatre 21. Um, and the first one, I think, um, in some ways connects with uh, your excellent Beyond Quarantine. Um, and it's uh, 
it's titled Performing the Everyday Tsvichanya Sojinnoshchi and um, actually it was um, uh, produced here uh, at the uh, Tadeusz Kantor Center for, for um, Art and, and, and Performance um, and uh, generally th this project was um, um, inspired by Kantor, by Tadeusz Kantor, the famous Polish uh, theatre practitioner and his idea that um, well, uh, art um, can or should be found in those um, everyday um, activities and gestures and uh, various artists were, were encouraged to um, um, follow um, counters um, ideas and um, well and uh, the performance uh, given by three actors um, who are actors with intellectual disability well on the one hand they were very kind of um, Beckettian alluding to, to Beckett's uh, the theater um, of the absurd so um, actually those everyday um, activities everyday gestures that they performed were kind of highly ritualized uh, they um, were, um, well, um, they were giving them kind of a safety pleasure at the same time they were, they were kind of distracting for, uh, them from the, um, their existential situation. But on the other hand, well, there was also this, um, there was something subversive about the very fact that we had Daniel Krajewski, uh, an actor with intellectual disability, who was giving his audience um, very detailed um, guidance as to how to brush your teeth. And this also kind of mocked this idea of inspiration porn, like uh, people with disabilities and especially intellectual disabilities being uh, applauded for performing like very simple um, activities. Um, but there was uh, yet another, I think, a very powerful performance that was given online by two actresses um, um, from uh, Theatre 21. Um, uh, it was titled uh, Body to Body with Marilyn in Marilyn Monroe, uh, um, obviously. And uh, yeah, in, in this performance, yes, they kind of manifested their body positivity. They kind of reclaimed their body as a site of pleasure, um, as a site of um, agency, also sexual agency. And I, I think that uh, this was so powerful, probably because, um, well, they were performing uh, in their rooms, in their private space. So. Um, um, their performance was kind of stripped of uh, theatricality, it was very honest, it was very um, real. That's it. <laughs> oh, yeah. One thing on the, about Theatre 21 is just I think also uh, good to add that in 2020 they got a uh, uh, passport politiki. So, 21? No, 20. 2020, I think. But during the pandemic, they get one of the like most prestigious, most prestigious uh, art mainstream. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, I know. Like, uh, but like uh, from the one of the most recognizable magazines, uh, politician magazine, politics, political uh, magazines, uh, the award for the best theater art is in Poland. That was really. Uh, Really, also hope to to fight for a um, for a voice. Thank you. Um, I would like to to follow up this topic about the visibility and gaining visibility, um, because um, during recent like two or three years, I think we could observe really. Um, big increase of visibility of people with disabilities in mass media and social networks in various organizations. Uh, we could see, we could read uh, a lot of art, press articles, we could see some you know, TV programs. And finally, sometimes, not always, but sometimes very um, uh, they go out of these traditional frames of uh, you know, charity on the one hand or superhero on the other hand. Sometimes they, they are much more objective and um, they present some particular uh, issues or 
just just particular subjects, I don't know, like interest, personal interest or something like this. And there are just much more of them, and we can see people with disability in much more spheres of public life than before. Uh, probably, partially, it is related to this Accessibility Act that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, but uh, I suppose that not only. And uh, I would like to uh, I would like to ask you uh, what do you think how how much it can be related to to, to to lockdown and what happened during the lockdown because um, we already mentioned uh, some factors like you know gaining the, this space in the internet and so on and um, this sensation of living as, as disabled let's say like this like isolated. Uh, but maybe maybe you, you can see some other factors um, of this of this change and also for example uh, we can see a uh, big growth of um, like we can see new alliances we can see new collaborations including artistic collaborations for example already mentioned theater 21 this year last year sorry uh, they made for the first time, I think, collaboration with a um, big mainstream theater, uh, theater TM from Warsaw, which is one of the biggest and most influential theaters now in Poland. And um, you know, we can see like subject of visibility in mainstream art galleries and so on. So I would like to to to, to ponder now on this subject and I would like to start from from Kasia and uh, I would like you to reflect maybe yeah. on how this you know, sure. uh, protest for example that the we have. Protest, yes. Um, actually I'd like to uh, yeah, see um, the time of uh, the COVID pandemic as a time uh, when um, certain um, alliances flourished or when certain bridges were built and actually what you said made me think about um, an exhibition, uh, an online exhibition um, that uh, was organized during the, the lockdown uh, by the Arsenal uh, Gallery in Białystok and which uh, also featured um, uh, a work by probably the most recognized uh, deaf artist in Poland. Um, and Daniel Kodowski. Um, and the title of the ex exhibition was um, Solidarity and Agency, and it featured, um, well, uh, works by really many artists representing um, various different um, uh, causes, identities, and so on and so forth. There was a feminist voice, there was the um, um, ecological ecological concerns were, were also addressed with their um, certain um, issues related to various um, minorities um, in Poland. And this exhibition was um, largely um, inspired by uh, Rebecca Solnit and um, her idea that um, those moments of crisis actually uh, breed um, solidarity and give us an opportunity for a kind of a, a collective um, action and I'm not really trying to say that um, the pandemic uh, totally transformed our society and made it better right but we've been uh, through a few such moments of uh, trauma and crisis the first one was pandemic then um, the war in Ukraine another one yeah then of course we may say that the ongoing crisis um, on the um, uh, on our at our border with, with Belarus um, shows that uh, well this solidarity um, well does is quite limited and doesn't include people of different uh, skin color for instance uh, but still I think that uh, there we have experienced those those moments. Um, um, of solidarity and uh, I think that it, it's good to remember about them and keep this momentum going and this is also conspicuous in um, uh, when it comes to um, um, uh, the black uh, strikes, the, the black marches 
And um, the thing that, uh, that this was probably the first time when um, women with uh, disabilities were fully kind of recognized by the Polish mainstream feminist movement, when uh, one of the um, most well-known um, 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 Polish um, um, disability feminist um, um, disability a activist Katarzyna Bielinowska, uh, she, uh, um, she became part of the uh, um, of the all women's strike. She was a member of the board, right? So, um, and actually, uh, Monica, I, I think that you could speak from your experience also, uh, um, yeah, about the, 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 the protests and actually. Um, yeah, I, I can add, um, I mean, First of all, I can add like some general reflection, but for me personally, it was very important um, um, shift in the you know um, disability discourse in, ter in, in terms of abortion, because usually when speaking about abortion, disability appears as an argument against abortion because all the pro-life organizations usually show the picture of a smiling child with Down syndrome saying, you want to kill this sweet little baby, you are a monster. And uh, of course the, the answer of very um, very often of, of even parents with, of children with Down syndrome is like, well, you forced me to give birth to this child, but then you didn't give me any support to you know, bring it up. So there was really time of big um, fury also among the, 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 the parents and especially mothers of children with disabilities, right? I have a friend who is a disability studies scholar and she, she does her research uh, in this field uh, of, of intellectual disability and she even asked uh, girls with Down sim syndrome, like teenagers, would you would like to have an abortion if you knew that your kid would have Down syndrome? And those girls said yes, because the life of person with Down syndrome in Poland is shitty. So, you know, th this were, were things that have never been said in the discourse about abortion and disability in Poland. So I think it was a very important moment to, to say that uh, it's not you know, like black and white. Uh, this, this was the one thing. And another thing was exactly what you said, the physical, personal uh, presence of women with disability during the protest. Um, I went personally for several of, of the marches. Uh, a lot of my friends did, and um, I have to say that it was probably for the first time or one first times in my life and in lives of a lot of my friends with disability that we went out to the streets, <laughs> so uh, to, to you know protest against something. So uh, it was really important moment of visibility. And uh, I observed also the increasing um, awareness of accessibility needs uh, in this uh, feminist organization that you mentioned, yeah, the All Women Strike. For example, they started to have uh, sign language translation during their uh, like events, conferences, and so on. They started to provide uh, the um, description of the images on their Facebook fan page or something like this. It be it began like in last two years, so I think it was it was really important. Yes, and I think that they also nuanced the um, uh, arguments that were uh, presented because um, um, at least as far as I remember, the protest that I attended in Wood, it all started with uh, well, Senator Oscar's birth. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, still the the discourse of uh, uh, you know abortion, eugenic disability is still very complicated in Poland, and I I, I don't want to say that we solved all the problems, 
but at least we went out of this uh, vicious circle of like you know all people with disability all women of disability uh, are against abortion and abortion is killing disabled kids I mean we we get we, we got uh, a little bit further in the discussion I mean uh, we, we can talk about some nuances like right because for example women, women with disability can also be pregnant and go, and also can need abortion this is the question that has never been discussed before for example so um, there are so many so many new subjects um, because of this protest um, so I think it's kind of paradox that uh, we are talking about lockdown but uh, this uh, a particular um, circumstance that we are discussing now uh, was uh, event in person and maybe because of the lockdown it was so strong because you know we were supposed to stay at home uh, we were supposed to be locked down and um, actually all those demonstrations were uh, treated by authorities as illegal so we were persecuted all the time uh, whenever we went out to the went out to the streets we were persecuted by the police um, including some physical let's say direct confrontations with police uh, sometimes spending whole nights outside because they didn't let us go back home and so on and probably if there was no, if maybe it's kind of paradox but if there was no lockdown probably it wouldn't be so strong because you know people would have thousand other stuff to do but during the lockdown they didn't so they all went out to the street but okay it's 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 probably another topic so i will go not further um i would like to go back to our alliance, new alliance and new uh, collaborations and uh, new forms of visibility uh, and I would like now to, to, to give us to Robert. Did you um, observe any new kind of collaboration, kind of alliance in, in the US during pandemics? Thanks to lockdown, or maybe um, despite of lockdown, as in case of our protests? Um, I, I think that in the United States we have a lot of similar things that you seem to be talking about that were happening here in Poland. It does seem that more grants were awarded to disability artists such as Riva Lair, who's probably the most um, well-known visual artist in the United States. Um, I think she received a genius grant, but it was in a year when multiple people with disabilities were receiving money for their artistic um, work. Um, I think foundations like Mellon in the United States suddenly have even the idea of not just disability rights but disability justice on their radar screen and are giving out more grants to educational institutions for collaborations that would center disability. So I, I am optimistic in that sense. It does seem like there has been a shift that's happened over the last few years. Um, we've been talking, well, I guess we're talking a little bit about intellectual disability, but um, you know, we may have been focusing mostly on physical disability, but I, I also noticed how lockdown brought out, say, um, neuroatypical or autistic ways of communicating and thinking that led to new collaborations. So when we went online um, in the middle of the semester in March 2020, um, an autistic student said to me, it's like, I love this, <laughs> because this is a way of communicating, because uh, initially we weren't using Zoom in my classroom just to finish out the semester of spring 2020, um, but they were sort of saying, like, because we were doing it all through text, that this mode of communicating is actually better for me, and I think that, um, you know, other neuroatypical people also experience um, the shift to a more online space and different modes of communication as liberating. So those kinds of collaborations happened, I think, over the past few years, too. Um, and in, as a result, I think this predates the pandemic. In the U.S., at least, there's been an explosion of conversations about um, neuroatypicality or even what gets called neuroqueerness. Um, 
I wouldn't say it's absolutely at the center of disability studies, but there has been a lot of just really transformative work thinking about um, what Margaret Price uses as a broad umbrella. She uses the term mental disability. Other people, as I said, use neurotypical or even neuroqueer. There's been a lot of discussion of, of those modes of being over the past few years, um, which I think is a great development. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really happy that finally we found some positives. <laughs> um, okay, I think we can now open the, uh, the floor for the public. Uh, if you have any questions or if you would like to share any experience or any comments, uh, we would love to we would love to hear it from you. Um, Anybody? Okay. Maybe. Okay. Um, we'll pass you the mic. Maybe. <laughs> Because they can't hear us. Okay. Is this the one? Yes. Can you share? 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 Dla mnie, jako osoby z ADHD i prawdopodobnie gdzieś też na spektrum, komunikacja internetowa była strasznie trudna i dalej jest, bo na przykład strasznie trudno mi się zabrać w ogóle do napisania maila do, i strasznie mnie stresuje czytanie maili, z których nie mogę wywnioskować ton na przykład, czy ktoś jest na przykład pozytywnie nastawiony, czy negatywnie i to wniosło też dużo stresu, więc to taka druga strona naszego... No wiem, że pan to uwzględnia i nie, nie zakładam, że jest to jedna w ogóle droga i nie ma żadnej innej, ale to taki komentarz właśnie na ten temat, że no, też samo skupienie przy ekranie, kiedy trzeba wysiedzieć na przykład 4 godziny pod rząd i wszystko wokół jest zastraszające, to jest okropne. Więc to trochę jak z chodzeniem do kina właśnie, że kiedy ma się swój ekran w domu, to można pójść do toalet, można zrobić herbatę i robić to naprawdę cokolwiek, ale w kinie jest troszeczkę taka... Po prostu trzeba usiąść i oglądać. I tak samo na, przykład na wykładach. No, nawet sam fakt, że ktoś obserwuje studentów, to już blokuje przed też na przykład rozpraszaniem się troszeczkę. Just quickly, really quickly, we will add the positive thing to be here. Uh, about this networking and what uh, last after the pandemic. Uh, I think it's like the project as European Access, uh, which I'm part of, the biggest artistic project to uh, support uh, and develop. Artists with disabilities in Europe that, uh, that happened during the pandemic. It was not easy to change all the plans for internet and right now to run over to just catch all the deadlines. But also, like the great example of what happened to Aldiqua, Italian uh, workers' union, artistic workers' union created by the artists with disabilities, European cluster of arts and disabilities, also another platform of starting like regular professional networking based on the art and disability sector. So I think it like a lot of researchers. Like I think like this last four, three years really changed everything for me as a practitioner and as a person, a creep, queer uh, person with my representation in academia, with the researchers that I can uh, read as <laughs> all translations of the like book of books, like having the lectures, having the exhibitions, having the 
um, basic civil rights and starting to think about all the things that we have talked like the last hour and two hours as a basic civil rights. So for me, this really, uh, this moment of pandemic was uh, groundbreaking for uh, recognition of our rights. Thank you. And um, is there anybody else in the audience who would like to ask something or add some comments? <coughs> Thank you for the discussion, and uh, actually teaching online also was very demanding and had, uh, it was a positive thing and uh, on one hand, uh, but very uh, stressful and difficult on the other, but um, uh, I would like to share, uh, like, uh, it is a, rather a, a statement than a comment or question, that for me, uh, lockdown was also a time of uh, huge accessibility in terms of my work, of my academic work. And Robert, you mentioned uh, film festivals, uh, and I was able to attend several film festivals only because there was pandemic and everything was online. And uh, the same with conferences that I could never afford to go or they were too far away. Uh, so, uh, in fact, this um, experience of accessibility is not only connected or having not enough money in the ground or something like that. So, I, um, yeah, that's my comment. So, if I may, so I got the mic. Um, yeah, just, just one more thing about uh, really teaching, because I teach in, um, um, in the English department, and basically what we do, we teach, teach language, and the pandemic um, totally changed our way of thinking about language teaching, I think. That, um, uh, prior to um, the COVID pandemic, I think um, everyone in the Institute of English Studies in which was really convinced that this cannot be done online, that we shouldn't do this online and that it, it will always compromise the quality of um, teaching and learning. Um, now this has totally changed because we needed to just needed to develop certain uh, new skills. Of course, it cost us a lot of uh, energy and a lot of time. But now, actually, we can run the classes in a hybrid format if need be, right? So um, um, we have a student with multiple scler sclerosis who cannot really join us in class and who can still participate in this class, and that wouldn't be possible. Um, not so much because we didn't have the technology, but <laughs> because of our limited thinking about what's possible. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, I agree with uh, Manda and Kasha, with what Kasha and Manda mentioned. I, for example, I also could participated in some conferences, uh, you know, in the U.S. Uh, just because they were online, and uh, in some in some classes, and I could teach classes online. It was much more comfortable for me, um, and I think it. Um, it, it refers to many spheres of our, of our life, to many types of job, because, for example, uh, before the pandemics, if you worked in um, some public institution like town hall, it was impossible to have a home office, you know, because everything should be on paper, each paper had to be signed by hand, <laughs> and you, you had to bring this paper personally, so it was completely impossible. And um, now, the, during the pandemic and after the pandemic, it turned out that it was possible. They worked online during two years and uh, they um, elaborated uh, all the procedures to do stuff online and to, you know, proceed the document online. So I think um, it might be very promising for many people with disabilities uh, that they will be able to work online in much more 
um, let's say, interesting jobs than before, because before the pandemic, of course, there were some jobs online that people with disabilities uh, did in Poland, but it was usually very you know, basic stuff, like sending emails and so on, and now it turns out that there is a lot of things to do, almost everything you can do online, uh, so I think it's very promising, but on the other hand, of course, what Robert mentioned before, uh, it's, it is kind of threat, because it means that you can work uh, all the time and from you know uh, from everywhere in the world and you you are supposed to be accessible and available uh, all the time uh, so it, it, is, it is of course uh, a danger of this situation there are no ideal situation it's like a uh, good and bad sides of it um, but yes I, 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 I'm really happy that you share this this um, positive experience and uh, I think we are approaching to, to the end, but if there's anybody else who would like to, to share something with us, I think we still have like, time for one comment more. Okay, two short, two short comments, please. Right, so first of all, I would like to say uh, thank you for this incredibly interesting lecture. And actually, I wanted to um, make some sort of a more personal comment as to this intersection of queerness and disability and how it plays into community and also the COVID-19 pandemic because um, the lockdowns were actually the time when I came to terms with my own disability and uh, many facets of my own queerness and transness and it also was the time when I started making friends who were also queer and disabled so I think uh, um, some, uh, some people for example cite TikTok as one of the um, questionable, let's say, things that came out of the pandemic but to me it was a incredibly useful tool for example in overcoming internalized ableism so I think that this is also a very interested, interesting thing to, uh, thing to consider so yeah that's what I wanted to comment on, thank you. Ja może po polsku będzie łatwiej się wyrazić. Ja w sumie mam pytanie do pana Roberta bardziej, ponieważ jako osoba, która trochę wkracza w środowisko ogółkowych i się interesuje tym, chciałam zapytać, jak to, że tak jakby nasza dyskusja trochę, trochę zjechała na, na edukację niż, niż właśnie samą sztukę, to w sumie jeszcze tej edukacji zostając. Chciałam zapytać, jak to właśnie wyglądało w czasie pandemii, jeśli chodzi o przekraczanie właśnie barier, granic, jeśli chodzi o właśnie edukację na uniwersytetach osób, które no właśnie nie posługują się językiem polskim, nie słyszą i no właśnie, tak jakby korzystając z, z, tej, z tej okazji też jakiejś amerykańskiej perspektywy chciałam się tego zapytać. I first want to validate the previous comment and, and say that it is a comment that I've heard from lots of students. I teach, um, most of my students I think are queer, and they have talked about how during lockdown it provided space to just kind of reflect on, on gender, on desire, and, and that space allowed for a lot of comings out, I think, of many, many people. Um, well, I think. Magda can also speak to uh, death experiences in, in Poland and elsewhere. Um, I live in Washington, D.C., which is sometimes, rightly or wrongly, sort of seen as the capital of the deaf world um, because yeah, uh, the University Gallaudet is there, which is one of the premier institutions for deaf education in the world, um, and also a site that has been complicated, but that made um, waves in the 1980s um, because of an action called Deaf President Now. So there were um, 
there was a board of trustees at Gallaudet University that was ready to install, uh, yet again, for the 200 year history of Gallaudet, another hearing person as president of the university, and students um, said no, <laughs> and they mobilized uh, an action that is known as Deaf President Now, they marched to the Capitol, and they eventually did have um, uh, a president who was deaf at, as the president of the university. I give you that anecdote just to talk about the ways in which deaf identity, um, at least where I work in, that is very highly developed and politicized. Um, I'm sure that it's the same in Poland that many deaf people well, this is complicated. Many deaf people would actually say, I'm not disabled, I speak a different language. Uh, I'm deaf and my community identity is, is sort of like a linguistic identity rather than a disability identity. I think that has changed over the last um, three decades, partly because as dis disabled activists have kind of reinvented the, me the meaning of disability, there's lots of deaf people who are like, oh, well, yeah, I'm happy to be part of this group that's changing the world, um, and if, if disability means that, then yes, I am uh, part of that disabled community. Um, it's also complicated in the sense that one often needs to use the Americans with Disabilities Act or other legal sources in order to get the resources that you need as a deaf person. So that's another moment where that attempt to distance oneself from disabled identity doesn't always work for deaf people. Um, but, so, I, I guess um, my, my point is that Washington, D.C. is a really politicized place where deaf identity is visible and the importance of deaf ed education and deaf community and deaf-owned businesses and things like that is really quite central. Um, Obviously, uh, I think both things need to exist from an educational perspective. That is, a university like Gallaudet that is basically all in American Sign Language. You, if you get a job there and you are a hearing professor, it is expected that you will learn ASL within your first semester or so, so that you can teach effectively at the university. So I think that's really important that that space exists and that Deaf people have the right to go to any university that they want and have the translation services that, that they need in order to survive in a large hearing location. So, to go to another university is a common. Um, I, I, I teach at a university that is not a deaf university and have had deaf students, and we try to collaborate a lot with Gallaudet and have um, interpreters for our events, um, just as there were interpreters here. Um, so it's it's not uncommon, I should say, um, though most of the deaf academics that I know did train at Calvet University at some point. A lot of deaf people in the U.S. eventually make their way through Calvet University in some way. I'll repeat the question because I don't think they could hear you. Um, the question from the floor was whether during the pandemic interpretation, translation, sign language was, was common or not. Um, I think the answer to that is largely no, um, though the disability organizations like the one that I showed at the beginning of the talk, Dance New York City, um, made a point of having um, a sign language interpreter. And we've at my university, I also tried to make a point of having sign language interpretation. It's quite expensive, actually, um, and that provides a barrier, but I think if you really believe in the sort of disability and deaf justice, then it's an expense that needs to be taken up. Um, so it's not common with most online events, but if one has a kind of disability consciousness, then one hopefully shapes the event in, in a way that includes um, ASL interpretation. Thank you so much for, for, for sharing this um, American experience uh, with that community during the pandemics. Uh, 
I think, unfortunately, we run out of the time. <laughs> so we are approaching the end of uh, today's event. Um, I would like to say thank you uh, to everybody who is here, but especially to uh, our distinguished guest, uh, Robert McCour, and my, uh, on my right, our panelists, uh, Katarzyna Olejczyńska and uh, Filip Pawlak. I would like also to um, say thank you to all our interpreters, uh, Wojtek and uh, Bartek, uh, who are translating from Polish to English and English to Polish, and also um, Magda and uh, Marzena, I hope I didn't mistake your names, uh, who are our sign language trans uh, interpreters. And um, thank you, of course, uh, to uh, Jagiellonian University uh, in general, who, who hosts us here today, and all my colleagues from the um, uh, research platform uh, Disability Studies in Eastern Europe and Configurations. Uh, thank you, everybody, and um, have a nice evening. <laughs>